Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me um, and that everybody can see my slides. If not, let me know. Uh, my name is Natasha Press from the Division of Infectious Diseases, and today I'm going to talk about skin and soft tissue infections. So I have no conflict of interest, and I do just want to make a land acknowledgement that I work on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and that this is important to today's discussion on skin and soft tissue infections, because a lot of the risks for skin and soft tissue infections are informed by social determinants of health, which in turn may be a cause of structural racism. So why do I want to speak about skin and soft tissue infections today? Well, it's a very common reason for patients to see their doctor, whether it's an outpatient visit, an ER visit, or a hospitalization. And it's the most common reason for people who inject drugs to seek medical care and accounts for up to 50% of hospitalizations for people who inject drugs. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a premise of how we approach skin and soft tissue infections in terms of whether they're purulent or non-purulent. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our OPAT program and then discuss the antimicrobial management for skin and soft tissue infections and how we delabel uh, penicillin allergies. We'll then move on to talk about chronic cutaneous ulcers when they're associated with a skin and soft tissue infection. And then we'll end off with mimics of skin and soft tissue infections and how to prevent recurrences. So in terms of types of skin and soft tissue infections, there's a lot of different types that really affect every level of the skin down to the muscle. And there's some that I'm not going to talk about. This is the part where I tell you what I'm not going to talk about. So I'm not going to talk about things like impetigo and folliculitis that affect the superficial levels of the skin. And I'm not going to talk about necrotizing fasciitis or other necrotizing skin and soft tissue infections. And I'm not going to talk about myonecrosis or anything in the muscle. So I'm really going to sort of focus on cellulitis and abscesses. So in general, when we approach skin and soft tissue infections, we approach them as either purulent or non-purulent. So non-purulent, as you can see by this leg, is just strictly cellulitis, where somebody comes in with a red, hot, swollen, painful body part. And that is um, opposed to purulent, where it's really a skin and soft tissue infection that's associated with an abscess or a pustule or purulent drainage. So in terms of our management of non-purulent versus purulent skin and soft tissue infections, when we see a non-purulent skin and soft tissue infection, it's usually due to a beta hemolytic strep. So that could be like group A strep, but it could be due to one of the other streps. So like group B, group C, group G strep. And for outpatient management for oral antibiotics, we'll generally just treat with the first generation cephalosporin like cephalexin or cefadroxol. And in terms of duration of therapy, there's no magic number of days. So most people are fine with about five days of therapy. Some people are gonna need longer, maybe because they have um, inadequate circulation to that body part or because it's a very extensive infection. But there's no magic number of how many days people have to take. In terms of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, where it's associated with an abscess, a pustule, or purulent drainage, this is usually due to Staphylococcus aureus. And if there is a collection of pus, that should be incised and drained. And then sort of depending on where you live and how much MRSA it, there is, you should consider MRSA coverage. So the BCCDC, when they look at all of their staph aureus isolates, 20% of them are MRSA, but we know that that number is higher at St. Paul's Hospital, for example. So when we choose um, antibiotic therapy, we'll often choose an antibiotic that's also going to cover MRSA. And the three that we tend to choose from are Septra, Doxycycline, and Clindamycin. And again, the susceptibilities of MRSA to these antibiotics can differ, and they can also differ over time, depending on which antibiotic people are using, how much selection pressure there is on the MRSA, how that MRSA spreads in the community. 
So according to the BCCDC most recent data, um, Septra is sort of the most reliable antibiotic for their MRSA, followed by Doxy and Clinda. But at St. Paul's, clindamycin is actually more reliable, and the VGH antibiogram actually showed that Doxy is more reliable. And then if you're not sure if it's Staph aureus and you're concerned about also covering for beta hemolytic strep, so if you're using clindamycin, that's actually pretty good for most strep. It covers about 80%. Septra is also pretty reliable. But doxycycline, we really don't have that data. And so you'd really have to add additional coverage for strep. Now, sometimes it's very obvious when you see a skin and soft tissue infection, whether it's purulent or non-purulent. There's like a big abscess. It's draining. It's obvious. But sometimes it's actually not obvious. And so you'll see that the emergency room doctors will um, sometimes do a point of care ultrasound for patients presenting to the emergency room with skin and soft tissue infection. And in fact, there was a systematic review that the eMERGE docs at St. Paul's did and really, they wanted to know what was the diagnostic accuracy of a point of care ultrasound to detect an abscess. So they looked at all the studies, they did a systematic review, and they found that the sensitivity was 95% and the specificity was 80%. So pretty good, not perfect. In terms of whether we use oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics, uh, IV antibiotics are really reserved for patients who have moderate or severe skin and soft tissue infections. And moderate skin and soft tissue infections are usually defined as patients who have signs of sepsis, so fever, tachycardia. We'll also use IV if patients have already been on appropriate oral antibiotics but had progression despite this. If their clinical picture is changing rapidly and they're having rapid progression of their erythema or symptoms, and also for some host reasons. So if the host is immunocompromised or there's concerns about uh, oral therapy with regards to adherence or tolerability. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our OPAT, which stands for Outpatient Parenteral Antibiotic Therapy. And basically what happens is if a patient comes to the emergency room with sort of a moderate to severe skin and soft tissue infection, but not requiring hospitalization, they'll generally get their first dose of antibiotics through eMERGE and then be referred to be assessed in OPAT the next day to see if they require further IV antibiotics or if they require transition to oral antibiotics. So we're on the eighth floor on 8D. You can see there's the reception and there's the tiny little room that the ID doctor works in. And this is actually the infusion room. Now, I know this really just looks like a picture of hospital curtains. So you're sort of going to have to use your imagine, imagination and kind of visualize that there are actually four chairs in this room. One, two, three, and four. So outpatients come in. They sit in a chair. They get their IV infusion of antibiotics and some wound care and sometimes a sandwich, and then they go home and um, they can come back the next day if they still require additional IV therapy. So in terms of non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections, the most common antibiotic that we use at OPAT is IV cefazolin, but in hospital, IV cefazolin is given usually every eight hours. But because we can only see these patients really once a day, we combine it with oral probenicid, and that allows us to give it once a day. We actually give a bit of a higher dose of cefazolin in patients with an elevated BMI greater than 30. But probenicid, what it does is it reduces the renal secretion and the clearance of the cefazolin. So it increases the cefazolin's concentration, it increases the cefazolin's half-life, and that allows us to give it as once daily treatment. This isn't something that you need to do in hospitalized patients because they're not going anywhere, they're in hospital, so they can have the, the regular cefazolin. But this is useful for outpatients. So what is the data for us actually using IV cefazolin with oral probenicid in this way? And actually there's not, not a lot. Okay, I'm gonna tell you about this trial um, on the left of the slide first. So this is a trial that's like 20 years old and what they did yes, is <laughs> they randomized patients to yeah. either IV ceftriaxone or IV cefazolin with oral probenicid. 
And these were patients who had sort of moderate to severe skin and soft tissue infection. So they, they were allowed to be in the trial if they had signs of sepsis like fever and tachycardia, and also if they had failed previous oral antibiotics. And basically, this showed equivalence between IV ANSEF with prevenicid versus IV ceftriaxone. Now, there's actually a more recent trial which was published, um, and this was actually done in Kelowna. And what they did in this trial was they said, well, you know, we're giving IV cefazolin with oral prevenicid, but maybe we could just give them oral Keflex, like cephalexin, like maybe they don't even need to have IV at all. So let's compare IV cefazolin with oral prevenicid to oral cephalexin and see. So they also did a randomized control trial, but it was a totally different group of people. In fact, you were excluded from this trial if you had two or more signs of sepsis. So if you had a white blood count of 13 and a heart rate of 92 when you first came in to emerge, you were excluded from this trial. If you had peripheral vascular disease or an elevated BMI greater than 30, you were excluded from this trial. And if you had um, failed oral antibiotics prior to coming to the emergency room, you, you were excluded from this trial. So really, all the reasons that we usually give IV antibiotics weren't really in this trial. And they did show equivalence between IV cefazolin with oral prevenicid and cephalexin. Um, but it was a very restricted group of patients. In fact, they screened over 2,000 patients, um, and only about 10% of them met criteria for this trial. And when they published the trial, their caveat was that they hadn't actually met their sample size and that their results could therefore be underpowered. So, when we start people on IV antibiotics, if they need them, we then want to transition them to oral antibiotics. This is for non purulent skin and soft tissue infections. And we do this sort of once they've turned the corner. So once their fever and tachycardia have resolved or they're starting to feel a little bit better, that's when we transition them to oral therapy. And um, generally, it's a first-generation cephalosporin. And again, if somebody's in hospital on oral antibiotics, then you would use cephalexin just because that's the antibiotic that's available here. But for people who we're giving a prescription to, to go to the community, we often also give cefadroxyl. And the big difference between cephalexin and cefadroxyl is that cephalexin or keflex is QID, so given four times a day, and cefadroxyl's given twice a day, which can be useful. So otherwise, if we're comparing cefadroxyl and cephalexin, they have the same spectrum of activity, the same side effect profile, the same efficacy, the same susceptibilities. And it's really just that cefadroxyl is given BID, so less frequently, which we hope enhances adherence. And particularly if patients are getting something that's daily dispensed, like let's say methadone, we will often piggyback on the daily dispense. So on our prescriptions, we'll write daily dispense plus carry, and then when they come in to get their methadone, they can get their cefadroxyl morning pill and the pharmacy will give them an evening pill to take home. And so in that way, it can help us to uh, enhance adherence. Now, we don't use first-generation um, cephalosporins in every single person with non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections. And so there are some exceptions, which is why the history is so important to really find out what kind of exposures people have had, um, which body parts involved is very important, depending on the flora that's in that body part. And then host characteristics can be important as well. So for example, if you have a patient who's had a bite, a dog bite, a human bite, a cat scratch or bite, then you really want to um, make sure that your coverage is covering the kinds of bacteria found in those particular mouths. So generally that means anaerobic and some gram negative coverage in addition to your staff and strep. If your patient has been swimming and hurt their foot on a sharp rock and got a skin and soft tissue infection, then again, that can be important, right? Was it fresh water? Are they at risk of aromonas? Does that need to be covered? Is it sewage water? Are they at risk of anaerobes? That needs to be covered. Is it like warm brackish water and they're at risk of vibrio that needs to be covered? So those kinds of questions on history are very important. 
And then where the infection is on the person's body is also important. So this person can't fully open their right eye. They have some redness and swelling and the starts of a preceptal or um, a preceptal cellulitis or a preorbital cellulitis. And, you know, for this person, they're also going to need uh, coverage. It's going to have some anaerobes and some other strep in it. And again, other areas like perianal, uh, genital areas, oral, um, all require coverage that's dependent on the flora in those areas. So there are exceptions to sort of the first uh, generation cephalosporin rule in terms of exposures like animal bites or water, in terms of location on the body, and in terms of patient characteristics. If the patient is neutropenic or immunosuppressed, they might be at increased risk of atypical organisms. And for example, patients with diabetic foot infections, we know tend to have polymicrobial infections. Can you please mute? So the next um, issue that we see a lot of are people who have a label of a penicillin allergy. And now if you have a label of a penicillin allergy and you have a penicillin allergy like anaphylaxis, then that's very important. Keep that label. But if you don't actually have a penicillin allergy and you just have the label, then it's actually harmful. And we know that people who have a label but don't have an allergy are given more broad spectrum antibiotics usually. And this can lead to more side effects, more drug resistant organisms, more C. diff infections. If they're inpatients, it can lead to more surgical site infections, longer hospital stays, and just in general, worse treatment outcomes. So um, I don't know if everybody has this app on your phone, but if you don't, download it immediately. It used to be called the Spectrum app, but um, now on my phone, it's called First Line app. So if it's not called First Line, I think you have to update your iOS system. And basically, it's an assessment for penicillin allergy, and it's an acronym. So it's called PenFAST, and FAST is actually stands for four questions. So the first question is, has your penicillin reaction been five years or less? The second question, the A, did you have anaphylaxis or angioedema? The third question, the S, did you have a severe skin reaction? And then the fourth question is, did you require treatment for it? Did you have to go to eMERGE? Did you have to use an EpiPen? And if somebody says no to all those questions, then the risk of having a severe penicillin allergy is much reduced. And we actually do an oral amoxicillin challenge. If they say yes, um, then we actually get immunology and allergy involved to do penicillin skin testing. So how do we do an oral amoxicillin challenge? So we do these at OPAT sometimes. And basically what we do is we order amoxicillin, 250 milligrams, one dose orally. And we also order on Cerner, the hypersensitivity power plan. And that power plan has a whole bunch of PRNs on it, like Benadryl, um, steroids, epinephrine. And we, the patient takes the amoxicillin. They sit in OPAT for an hour. They have their vital signs done every 15 minutes. And at the end of the hour, as long as they're feeling fine, they go home and they get delabeled of their penicillin allergy. Now, for somebody who um, really does, let's say, have a penicillin allergy and we're concerned about which other antibiotics we can use, the um, first line app is also helpful. So if you go to guidelines and you go down to useful tools and you press on antibiotic allergy cross sensitivity, it takes you to this screen where it has either uh, beta lactams or other antibiotics. And penicillin is a beta-lactam. So if we press on that, and then we go to penicillin and press on penicillin, because let's say that's the one we care about, then we will actually get a list of other medications, other antibiotics that are considered safe to prescribe. So I can see here that if I'm seeing somebody in OPAT and I want to give them cefazolin, I can do that safely. So, well, first of all, I was lucky enough to get a selfie with the penicillin delabeling team, which is uh, antimicrobial stewardship and pharmacy. 
But I just want to tell you a little bit about what they've been doing in patients. So about eight years ago, they did a point prevalence study. And what they found was that 20% of patients who were hospitalized at that time had a label of a penicillin allergy. And since then, over the past eight years, they have been delabeling patients at a rate of about one every four to five days. So in fact, since 2013, they've delabeled over 500 patients. And there's actually a new project coming soon where pharmacists are going to assess hospitalized patients who have the label of a penicillin allergy using the PenFast tool that I just showed you. And if the score is zero, which means they haven't uh, had a reaction in the last five years, they haven't had angiodemia, they haven't had a bad skin reaction, and they haven't required treatment for a reaction. So if the score is zero, then the pharmacist is actually going to approach the team to discuss doing an oral amoxicillin challenge. And so in that way, even more patients are hopefully going to be delabeled. Okay. I wanted to move on to antimicrobials and talk about purulent skin and soft tissue infections and specifically some of the oral medications that we use for MRSA. And in this, oh, you can't see the very bottom, but in this chart, we have clindamycin, doxycycline, septra, and linezolid at the bottom here. And, you know, we don't use linezolid a lot. And you might say, why not? Because actually 100% of our MRSA are susceptible to it. And it also covers group A strep, so, or beta hemolytic strep in general. So why wouldn't we? And the reason is, is that it costs $80 a day in the community. Now, actually in hospital, just because of how buying is done in the formulary, these are actually, it's really cheap. It's like a buck 50 a day, a buck 50 a pill for linezolid. But in the community, it's $40 a pill. So there's a big price discrepancy for patients who are outpatients. And this is really prohibitive in terms of us using this medication in some groups of patients. So we're going to focus on clindamycin, doxycycline, and septra. And just in terms of cost, you can see that their cost per day for all of them is really reasonable. Uh, about $2, or in the case of SEPTRA, less than 50 cents a day. And these are the St. Paul's antibiogram susceptibilities. So this has changed over time, and it will change over time. So you have to sort of keep up with it. But right now, for MRSA, uh, clindamycin tends to be uh, the most reliable. The problem with clindamycin, though, is... First of all, it's frequency. Um, as an outpatient, it's TID, which can be challenging. And then also it's adverse event profile in that it has the highest risk factor for C. difficile. Um, SEPTRA is a cheap and adequate choice. Uh, there can be problems with it, particularly if patients are on other medications which increase potassium, such as, for example, spironolactone where you, you really have to uh, be careful. And then doxycycline, which currently uh, has less activity, um, actually is the one that probably has the, less, the least robust data in terms of its use. So when we see people at OPAT and um, we need to use IV medications for MRSA, it becomes a little bit more challenging. So first of all, vancomycin is generally given at least twice a day, and each infusion takes like a couple hours. So that would mean that somebody would have to come back to OPAT on the same day, plus they'd be basically occupying one of those chairs for four hours, which would really impact the flow of our OPAT. So that's the challenge for vancomycin. For daptomycin, um, there's antimicrobial stewardship issues about using it just for, um, just for convenience. Uh, it is, however, once daily, and we don't do this, but other OPATs in the world actually give it as a two-minute push. So very fast and very good for the flow of patients. I did want to talk about a new antibiotic that is going to be here very soon. It's called Dalbavancin. And it's basically like vancomycin, which lasts for a week. So I've never used it. I've never even seen it. 
but it's a one dose treatment and it takes about 30 minutes to infuse. And there was a study in the New England Journal several years ago that compared it to vancomycin and linezolid for skin and soft tissue infection and found it non-inferior. And it was actually approved by Health Canada a few years ago for skin and soft tissue infection. And I know it's coming soon because actually yesterday I got an email from the pharmaceutical representative asking if I could meet about dalbavancin. So it's going to be here very soon. So there's a couple of things that we don't know. We don't know what the cost is going to be. And we don't really know what the availability is going to be, whether there's going to be special authority criteria on it in terms of how it should be used. But I think it's, it sounds like a very desirable drug, right? Like vancomycin that lasts a week. Oh, my God, what could be better? But I just do want to say that it's only been approved for skin and soft tissue infections. And I know that everybody's going to sort of want to use it for bone and joint infections and maybe for bacteremia, particularly in patients that have adherence challenges. But I wanted to show this slide just to show you that there's really no data for that. There's been just three small retrospective studies looking at the use of dalbavancin in more serious infections, um, particularly in groups of people who had challenges with adherence. And these studies really didn't conclude anything. I mean, the, the, most of the people had already finished a large portion of their therapy with standard therapy. Like in one study, they were treating people for osteomyelitis and they'd already done five of the six weeks in hospital and then they gave them a shot of dalbavancin and sent them home. So like, what does that tell me? I don't know, right? So um, the other thing is, is that there were a lot of people lost to follow up. There was a lot of people who didn't have adequate source control. So really not conclusive. Um, the results did show that somewhere between 40 and 80% of people had clinical success. Don't really know what that means. But I think it is interesting. And, um, you know, we'll have to see as more data becomes available, whether there's a possible role for Valbavancin as salvage therapy for infection, serious infection. But right now, just licensed for skin and soft tissue infections. Visitor in Portland. Oh, can you please mute? So when patients are actually hospitalized because they're sick enough to be in hospital for their skin and soft tissue infection, these patients often have sepsis. They've often started empirically by emergency on, for example, IV vancomycin and IV ceftriaxone. Uh, these patients, you, you don't need to worry about once daily treatments because they're actually in hospital. And um, Usually when you reassess the patient sort of after 24 to 48 hours and their blood cultures, let's say, don't grow anything or don't grow MRSA, and you're reassessing their, their leg or whatever body part is infected, if it is non-purulent, at that time you can actually discontinue the IV vancomycin. It's unlikely to be needed. And you can really transition the ceftriaxone to either IV cefazolin or IV penicillin. Uh, yeah, I, I've been waiting there, for it now for my dad. So oh, can you please, now. can you please I'm mute? So um, the one study that I did want to tell you about um, was a study that, that came out in the Lancet earlier this year. Hungry, yeah, I think. Oh, can everybody that, check their uh, mute uh, and please mute? mute. Um, so there was a study yeah, that came out in the Lancet right earlier in the year. And... Um, First of all, the most amazing thing about this study is that they did it on Cerner. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but they did it. Uh, it was a retrospective study. So basically what they did is they looked at all the patients who were admitted with a beta hemolytic strep infection. And they looked at whether or not they got clindamycin in addition to their beta lactam. Now, these were invasive infections. So it means that they actually had, let's say, positive blood cultures. And I'm just gonna talk about group A strep because what they found was that in patients with invasive group A strep infection, so let's say people came in and they had group A strep in their blood and they had a, a skin and soft tissue infection, they found that the addition of clindamycin led to a decrease in hospital mortality. Now they did not find this with the other beta hemolytic strep, so they didn't find this with like group B or group C or group G strep. And they found it even in patients who didn't have necrotizing fasciitis or shock. So usually when we see patients with necrotizing fasciitis or group A strep shock, we give high dose clindamycin. But these were patients who, they were sick, they had group A strep in their blood, but they didn't have necrotizing disease and they didn't have shock. 
Um, and for them as well, the addition of clindamycin, kind of just until they turned the corner and were getting better, um, led to a decrease in hospital mortality. Retrospective study, but interesting. Okay, I wanted to move on and talk about patients with chronic cutaneous ulcers and with secondary skin and soft tissue infections. And here you can see this large cutaneous ulcer and then the redness and swelling around it. And chronic cutaneous ulcers are a common complication of injection drug use. It's due to sort of this cycle of repeated damage to the skin and the tissues and the lymphatics. And just having infections can cause this damage. So that in itself can be a risk factor for more infections and for cutaneous ulcers, but also getting phlebitis from injecting in a site. Um, and then the drugs themselves and the things that the drugs are mixed with can be either pro-inflammatory or sclerosing. And so also cause damage, which um, with that repetition can lead to um, ulcers. So if somebody has a cutaneous ulcer, but they don't have infection, then the primary therapy is really just getting rid of any devitalized or necrotic tissue. So debriding, doing wound care, if there's swelling to do elevation and compression. These wounds, they're just kind of sitting there. So they get colonized with bacteria. Bacteria live on them. But that in itself is not a reliable indication of infection. And so how would you know if somebody did have a secondary infection? Well, they would have, a, they would have actually symptoms of infection. So maybe fever or at the site of the ulcer, increased pain and purulent drainage and cellulitis surrounding the wound. So this is just really a common um, swab result that we would see. And I just took this off of Surter and it's just somebody's superficial wound. And you can see that it shows some pus, it shows different kinds of bacteria, and it sort of grows out four bugs that we see a lot at St. Paul's Hospital. So Staph aureus, beta hemolytic strep, and in this case it's group C, Carinibacterium diphtheria, which is automatically reported to public health, and it has a toxigenicity test done, and it's negative, and then Arcanobacterium hemolyticum. Yes. So when you see this in a wound, in a chronic ulcer, what do you treat? What does it mean? So we did talk about beta hemolytic strep and staph being important and that those can cause secondary skin and soft tissue infection. So we would treat those. But what about the Carinibacterium diphtheria and the Arcanobacterium? So Carinibacteria diphtheria is actually endemic in the downtown east side. So we see a lot of it colonizing chronic wounds. It's usually non-toxigenic because everybody's been vaccinated against diphtheria, I hope, because it did used to be called the strangling angel of death. So I hope everybody had their vaccine. And we know that it colonizes chronic ulcers. Now it can be responsible for the ulcer and it can rarely also become invasive, but in general, it's usually just sitting there. And Arcanobacterium, again, it can be a wound pathogen. It can become invasive, but usually it's actually a throat pathogen. Um, but for both of these, actually the, the the treatment of choice is really um, historically uh, what we've been using for a long time. So penicillin, erythromycin, but in fact, a lot of antibiotics that we use anyway to treat skin and soft tissue infection do cover either Carinibacterium or Arcanobacterium. So for Carini, for example, Banco, Dapto, uh, Ceftriaxone for Arcanobacterium, some beta-lactams, um, clindamycin probably. So even though those aren't the drugs of choice, sometimes the drugs that we're using anyway, will treat them. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Carinibacterium diphtheria because you saw on that report that it gets reported to public health and gets a toxigenicity test done. And in fact, what happens is it gets sent to the National Microbiology Lab, the NML, which is in Winnipeg, and they do the tests. And what they've noticed is that in the past 
10 years, they've had this huge increase, like actually over a thousand percent increase in the number of Carinibacterium diphtheria samples that they've received. And it's not clear whether this is due to Carinibacterium actually being an emerging pathogen or whether it's due to Carinibacteria diphtheria just being better detected. Because, you know, we've had newer lab techniques in the past 10 years. And maybe before this was just being sort of partially worked up and being reported out as skin flora or diphthoids, but not being fully worked up as Carinobacterium diphtheria. So here's the interesting thing about the NML, the National Micro Lab in Winnipeg getting the samples. <clears throat> Almost all of them are from Western Canada and most from BC. 99% of them are from skin. So exactly what we saw on that swab report. And most of them are non-toxigenic. Again, the people, most people are vaccinated, so they shouldn't have toxin-producing strains. Okay, I wanted to move on to mimics of cellulitis and other reasons for warm, swollen, red legs. So you can see in this picture that there's this uh, large erosion, and it's kind of um, a bit weepy, and there's some thickened skin and hyperpigmentation. And does anybody know what this is? So that is chronic venous stasis, which is the most comic mimic of skin and soft tissue infection. And sometimes it can be hard to differentiate it, but some clues that it's chronic venous stasis are that it's more slowly progressive. It doesn't respond to antibiotics. It's often bilateral, but not always. It can be itchy and people shouldn't have uh, symptoms of infection, things like fever or leukocytosis. So those can be hints that it's chronic venous stasis. Here are some other mimics. Okay, tell me what you guys think these are. So this is a normal foot and this is a hot red swollen foot. And what do people think that is? Okay, that's gout. Um, this is bilateral, erythematous, kind of scaly. And what do you think that is? Okay, that's some sort of dermatitis, but that's not a skin and soft tissue infection. Okay, this leg is fine. This leg is swollen, painful, red. And what do you think that is? So that's a DVT. And these legs are bilaterally swollen. They have this sort of bilateral redness that's um, shiny on both legs. And do you know what that is? That is lymphedema. So there are several mimics of skin and soft tissue infection and cellulitis is really largely a clinical diagnosis. In fact, in studies, up to 30% of red leg has been misdiagnosed as cellulitis and has led to unnecessary hospitalizations and antibiotics. So clues that it's a mimic is really if it's chronic, if it's slow, if it's not responding to antibiotics, um, bilateral can be a clue. But what about systemic signs? Well, systemic signs can sometimes help if they're present to tell you that it's cellulitis, but even in people who have cellulitis, a lot of them can be a febrile. Um, most of them cannot have a white count. And even though there is a CRP elevation, that's very nonspecific and can happen in lots of different inflammatory conditions. Okay, so the last topic that I wanna talk about is preventing recurrence. Recurrence is very common. Recurrence of skin and soft tissue infections, very common. And there's two things that we focus on. One is skin integrity. So, you know, your skin is your first barrier to prevent infection. It's okay if the bacteria are living on your skin. We just don't want them to get under the skin and cause infection. So anything that is jeopardizing that kind of armor, that barrier to infection should be treated. So whether that's dermatitis, athlete's foot, open wounds, Whatever it is, you really want your skin to be perfect and intact. The next thing that's a big risk factor is edema. And if there's a sort of systemic cause for edema, like congestive heart failure or liver failure or something like that, then those should be treated. 
But if it's local, then often we use elevation and compression. And then there's some systemic features, which are risk factors for recurrence, which are more difficult to treat, like aging, but also things like elevated BMI or insecure housing. Um, and you can imagine that if somebody doesn't have somewhere to live and they're walking around all night in wet shoes, that's going to put them at risk for skin and soft tissue infection. I'm also going to talk about a strategy of using prophylactic penicillin for non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections. And for purulent infections, I'm going to talk about decolonization for recurrent MRSA. So for athlete's foot, you can just see in this picture that there's maceration and peeling between the toes and the web spaces. And patients, as outpatients, can actually get this over the counter, just ask for athlete's foot cream. Um, but if you're ordering it for your inpatients, and we tend to use, in OPAT, we tend to use a lot of either clotrimazole 1% cream or tobenafin 1% cream. And patients can put this on twice a day for weeks until it's better. Um, this is uh, stasis dermatitis. And um, it can be um, either like kind of dry and itchy or kind of blistery and oozing. And if really chronic dryness and itchiness is a problem, then to give them something like Vaselinish, like a petroleum-based emollient is helpful. If it's more like kind of oozy, itchy, sometimes we'll order an OPAT betamethasone valerate 0.1% ointment. And they just need to use that once, maybe twice daily for about a week shouldn't be used for a super long time, but just until those symptoms have resolved. For venous stasis ulcers, it's really about basic wound care. And we often refer these patients to community sites from OPAT, where they get debridement of the devitalized tissue. And then sometimes they'll get a compression dressing. So the dressing to cover the wound and then the compression on top of that to decrease the edema to let the wound heal. There's really no role for systemic antibiotics to promote healing in these ulcers. And so there's really no role for swabbing. They just really need wound care and compression. So in terms of treating edema, there was a study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine last year looking at compression socks. And basically, this was a randomized control trial, and they took half the patients and gave them compression stockings, and the other half, they didn't. And then they followed them. And in order to get into this study, you already had to have had a risk, like you already had to have had, like declared yourself as somebody who gets recurrent um, skin and soft tissue infections. So you had to have had at least a couple episodes of skin and soft tissue infections to get into this study. And in fact, this study was stopped early for benefit. So in the group that had the compression stockings, 15% had recurrence at six months. And in the group that didn't have the compression stockings, 40% had recurrence at six months. So this is an easy intervention. There are a couple caveats, as there always are. So the first is that if somebody has, um, if you have concerns about somebody's arterial supply, you don't really want to compress the area too much because you don't want to cause ischemia. So particularly in people who have known peripheral artery disease or diabetics who may have peripheral artery disease, we'll sometimes have these patients assessed at the vascular clinic at St. Paul's where they can do um, ankle brachial indexes, or if some patients they can't do that in, then toe pressures. But they do a much more... Um, a much more uh, thorough evaluation um, of their peripheral circulation. The other group that sometimes compression therapy can be challenging in are people who have very frail skin because the stockings can actually cause like abrasions. Um, but there are special there are special stockings. There's lots of different kinds, and some of them are very soft. So sometimes you can find the right ones for those patients. And then I've had patients tell me, I can't do it because I can't even reach my toes. So there is a certain amount of dexterity to put them on and take them off if you don't have somebody to help you. But again, there's stockings that have zippers and Velcro. Um, for people who kind of need specialty stockings, I'll often refer them to rehab medicine 
But what I do um, at my level of stocking knowledge is I will give people a prescription just for 20 to 30 um, millimeters of mercury pressure and just knee high stockings, which really look like the ones in those pictures. So for people who you've really tried to have excellent skin integrity and to get rid of their edema, and they're still having recurrent non-purulent skin and soft tissue infections, what can be done? Well, one of the things that we'll sometimes do is give prophylactic penicillin V at a dose of 300 milligrams twice a day. And this is also based on a randomized control trial that was done about eight years ago. And in this trial, what they did is they gave half the people penicillin every day to try to prevent skin and soft tissue infection. And in the other half, they gave them placebo. And then at the end of the year, they looked at their numbers and they found that in the group that got penicillin prophylaxis, 22% of them had had a recurrence of skin and soft tissue infection. And in the group that didn't, 37% of them had had a recurrence. So the number needed to treat was five. So you'll have to decide if you think it's worth it to treat five people for a year with penicillin prophylaxis to prevent one episode of cellulitis. Oh, and the only other issue was that, well, there's a couple other issues. One, when the prophylaxis was stopped, the protective effect stopped. So um, it wasn't a lasting effect. And the other thing that I didn't put on this slide was that the people who are at the highest risk, people with very elevated BMI who had had multiple recurrences, were the people who did the worst on the penicillin prophylaxis. So it does work for some people, but it's not, not perfect. Okay, in terms of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, sometimes these are patients who come in with MRSA abscesses and surrounding cellulitis, and um, they're always coming into eMERGE and getting incisions and drainages and antibiotics, and it, it can be really frustrating. And so in addition to, again, excellent skin integrity, Sometimes we will offer these patients decolonization. And how I describe it to patients is that the staff is living on you and I'm gonna to try to get the staff off of you. So this is actually a weak recommendation based on the data. And when you look at all the studies that have been done on this, really the conclusion is that it may temporarily sort of eradicate the MRSA from people's bodies, but in the long term does not prevent infection. But for some people, it's a fairly benign intervention and they find it helpful. And so for those people, I will prescribe mupirocin ointment and I'll ask them to put it just on the inside of their nose. This is when their infection's um, finished. So their infection's been treated and now we're just trying to de-staff them. So they put the mupirocin ointment just on the inside of their nose twice a day for a week. And at the same time, they either do bleach baths or chlorhexidine body washes. So if they're a shower person, then I order chlorhexidine body washes um, with a prescription. And so they go into the shower and then they do the chlorhexidine and then they rinse and moisturize. If they're a bath person, then I tell them that they can do bleach baths a couple times a week for a few months or really as long as they want. And basically they're filling up a tub with water. They're adding one quarter cup of household bleach and they're lying in the tub for 10 minutes until the water gets cold, rinsing, moisturizing, doing that a couple times a week. There was, um, there was, there was one study looking at, there've actually been a couple studies, but one study looking at the role of infectious diseases consultation in reducing recurrence. And in this study, oh, somebody's not muted. Can you please check that you're muted? Um, one of the, uh, in this study, the most common risk factors were venous stasis, athlete's foot, and diabetic foot ulcer. And what they found is that about a quarter, 26% of patients who were seen by an ID doctor had one of those risk factors addressed, compared to 2% of patients seen by, we'll just say, another kind of doctor. So um, even as ID doctors, we still have a lot of work to do in addressing underlying risk factors for recurrence. So that's really the end of my talk. We sort of started looking at this premise of how we approach skin and soft tissue infections in terms of purulent or non-purulent. And we talked about the antimicrobial management, 
but with the caveat that the history is really important in terms of exposure, location in the body, the host. Um, we talked about uh, chronic wounds being colonized, but that they can also have secondary skin and soft tissue infection. We talked about mimics of skin and soft tissue infection and particularly chronic venous stasis being the most common mimic. And then we talked about some ways to prevent recurrence, both in terms of purulent and non-purulent infections. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. I think we have a couple minutes. Thanks, Natasha. It's David Harris. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Terrence Young's question first. Um, it says in the chat, um, if oral lenezolid in hospital costs only a few dollars and has good bioavailability, is it feasible and cost savings to give them to people with SSTIs that would otherwise need IV Vanco to facilitate earlier discharge and shorten hospital stay? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's a couple issues. I mean, I think that people who are actually being hospitalized are generally are quite sick. So when they initially come in, there's often a rule out sepsis component. We're waiting for the blood cultures. So in that case, IV vancomycins usually started initially. But certainly once you have, you know, once you've sorted out the patient and they don't have, let's say, MRSA bacteremia, and you want to use linezolid for skin and soft tissue infection um, in hospital, that would be reasonable. Awesome, thanks. My question is around the clindamycin. You presented uh, some um, data around, uh, a retrospective data about using clindamycin and group A strep uh, skin and soft tissue infections. And when would you, when would you use uh, clindamycin uh, for somebody with a, a cellulitis coming into hospital, or are you going to add it to everybody based on that? Yeah, so no, you know, I think I'm just thinking about a patient that I saw last time I was on ID service. And this patient was really sick in a merge um, with sepsis, a very, very bad skin and soft tissue infection of his leg, but not necrotizing, although plastics did see him and he did get imaging. So one of those really sick patients that you're concerned about. And, you know, in that patient, that's the kind of patient that you might consider it. Now, he did end up having group A strep in his blood, but obviously up front when you're seeing somebody in a merge, you don't know that. Yeah. So with those like severe sepsis or those people with systemic symptoms. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a retrospective study. It's a Cerner study. Um, they only showed that for group A strep. They didn't show that clindamycin decreased in hospital mortality for the other beta hemolytic streps. So, uh, you know, I think, I think although we, we definitely give it for necrotizing and skin and soft tissue infections, I think this is interesting about invasive infections. Um, but I think, yeah, it's really case by case and you'd, you'd have to see the patient and, and really depend what your pretest probability is in terms of how sick they are and, and what you think. There's a question from Ted in the chat. Uh, Ted Steiner, um, what are your thoughts on high dose cefazolin, or sorry, cephalexin for strep cellulitis as opposed to IV cefazolin? Yeah, so I think there's so many more studies that need to be done um, looking at IV cefazolin for Benicid versus other antibiotics. Um, you know, the studies that we don't have. So we don't have studies that compare, let's say, once daily IV cefazolin with oral fobenicid to standard dosing cefazolin, like Q8. We don't have higher dose uh, cephalexin compared to IV cefazolin fobenicid. Um, so still, like, lots of work that needs to be done there. Thanks. There's no more questions in the chat. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>